Hi, I'd like to thank everybody for coming to our forum tonight on question two. My name is Jim McCarthy. I am the chairman of the York County Republican Committee, and I'll be moderating uh, this panel this evening. A couple of just uh, rules of thumb. Um, we may have some folks that disagree with each other. That's very common. But we would ask that you remain respectful. And if it's during the question and answer period, it has to be in the form of a question, or I will actually uh, ask you to, uh, to stop talking. We're not here to pontificate or anything like that. Just keep it respectful. We're going to keep it flowing. We hope to be done between 8 and 8.30 at the latest. Um, but I want to talk about and bring to you the fact that we have another referendum that is up. A lot of times people don't even know what these referendums are. I'm going to take a moment to actually read to you what question two is. Um, and we do want to also uh, welcome the people at home tonight. The text of the question reads, do you want Maine to expand Medicaid to provide health care coverage for qualified adults under the age of 65 with incomes at or below 138% of the federal poverty level, which in 2017 means 16,643 for a single person or $22,412 for a family of two. That is the actual question how it reads on the ballot. Uh, in the format, we have uh, four panelists tonight. Each are going to talk for a few minutes and share information about the uh, subject matter and also share their views on the expansion. Right after that, we will be following uh, with a short question and answer period from the audience. And again, just uh, act respectively and try to stay on uh, topic. So for our panel from left to right is uh, Jacob Posick. Uh, Jacob is the uh, policy analyst for the Maine Heritage Policy Center, which is a research and educational organization. Their mission is to uh, formulate and promote conservative public policies based on the principles of free enterprise, limited constitutional government, individual freedoms, traditional American values, all with the purpose of providing public policy solutions that benefit the people of Maine. Jo uh, excuse me, Jake has also co-authored the uh, Maine Heritage Poli Policy Center's report on Maine's history with Maine Care expansion and the experience of other states that have expanded their Medicaid programs recently. Uh, Jake is from Turner, received his BA in Poli-Sci from uh, the UMaine, and to his left is Representative uh, Deb Sanderson. Deb Sanderson is in her fourth term as a uh, Maine State Representative for House District 88. That includes uh, Chelsea, Whitefield, Jefferson, and part of Nobleboro. She uh, serves as the House Minority Lead on the Maine <clears throat> Legislature's Health and Human Services Committee, which is uh, the legislator's first-line policy enactment and oversight of the state's programs to help the truly needy. Outside of the legislature, uh, Representative Sanderson works at Eastern Traders in Nobleboro um, and spent 10 years working at the Maine Veterans Home uh, in Augusta. Immediately to her left is Representative Heather Siraki. Heather is also in her fourth term serving the main House of Representatives for the people of Scarborough. As in the legislature, Representative Siraki serves on the Appropriations and Financial Affairs Committee. That plays a pivotal role in shaping the state spending plan. She uh, also serves on the Maine Children's Growth Council, the Maine Children's uh, Justice Tax Force, and previously served on the Substance Abuse Services Commission. And outside of the legislature, uh, Heather Soraki is happily married, has grown children, and still works uh, in the dental industry uh, in a dental office, and uh, also a volunteer for the Scarborough Academic De Decathlon team. And finally is Annalee Rosenblatt. Annalee is a human resource and labor relations consultant and a resident of Scarborough for 30 years. She served on the local uh, school board, local government committees, and also as director of the Scarborough Chamber of Commerce. She's also the mother of a special needs child. Her daughter, who is now an adult, was born with a disability and has been serviced by Maine Care. With experience in private insurance markets and Maine Care, Annalee has learned how to navigate the health care, insurance, and Maine Care systems with perseverance over the years. Um, at this moment, I would turn this over to, uh, to Jacob. Jake, go ahead. Thank you, Jim. Um, what I'd like to do with this time uh, briefly is to uh, give you an overview of the Medicaid program and some of the costs associated with it. 
Um, and uh, just to preface that, a lot of the stuff that we talk about tonight uh, can be found in the report that Jim referenced in my introduction um, that we publish at the Maine Heritage Policy Center. You can access that at mainpolicy.org slash reject expansion. So if you uh, want insight on some of the numbers that we discussed tonight, you can find them there. In terms of the Medicaid program as a whole, Medicaid is a public health program that is funded jointly between state governments and the federal government. In Maine, our program is called Maine Care. A lot of people get that confused with Medicare. Medicare is for a uh, person 65 and older. Maine Care is Maine's version of the Medicaid system. The uh, contribution by state is determined by an equation called the Federal Medical Assistance Percentage, uh, which is based on a state's per capita income. Typically, the wealthier a state is, the more they're expected to contribute. Um, so the federal government pays less and the state pays more. And um, the inverse for poorer states, they get more help. In the state of Maine, the federal government pays about 64% of uh, Medicaid costs, and the state of Maine is expected to pick up 36% of Medicaid costs in our state. And what I'd like to do is um, talk about what drives costs in the program and give you some insight on um, just how much we think this would cost. Um, the program itself, the cost is really associated with enrollment. And in 2002, when we last expanded Medicaid, they said that we would uh, increase, uh, we would add 11,000 new Mainers to the program. The program was eventually capped at 25,000. So uh, that had a lot to do with the ballooning cost back then. And we believe that um, the same will likely happen today. Proponents of expansion uh, tell us that only 70,000 Mainers would be affected um, and get this new coverage. The Office of Fiscal and Program Review, which is the office that makes the fiscal notes for uh, bills and referendum questions, they're already anticipating about 90,000 Mainers. And uh, just to give you uh, a picture of who's eligible, in Maine today, there are about 144,000 Mainers who earn up to 138% of the federal poverty line, or federal poverty level. There's an additional 80,000, uh, about 80,000, who earn between 138 and 200% of FPL, who would have new incentive to marginally reduce their earnings in order to come onto the program. And that's actually what we saw uh, in Tennessee. There was a state level study done that showed that after large scale disenrollment in their Medicaid program, they had uh, an uptick in private insurance, job searching, uh, many different areas after they were taken off of this program that kind of show that people do limit their earnings to retain free health care from the government. And so, uh, what we're anticipating in Maine is that it's going to be much greater than 70,000 people who enroll. And in a lot of other expansion states, uh, there have been 31 states thus far who have expanded, 32 if you count Washington, D.C. And these states had the choice to do so after the Supreme Court uh, gave states the options, essentially, because they determined uh, the Affordable Care Act could not force states to opt into expansion. And so in Maine, what we're anticipating is that over the next five years, and these numbers are from the Maine Department of Health and Human Services, I, I didn't make these up, $400 million over the next five years would be Maine's share of the cost. And from 2022 onward, it would be about $100 million. And the reason why that is is because um, under expansion, I had mentioned before the traditional program is funded about 6436 under expansion the federal government takes 90% of the cost after 2022 and Maine would have to foot the bill for 10% and this 400 million dollar figure is only 10% of the cost over the next five years and I'm sure the legislators to my left here will be able to tell you this money does not exist in the state budget currently there are two ways we can do it we can eliminate programs or we can tax Mainers. Those are the only two ways you'll get this money. 
Um, I'd just like to share with you some significant cost overruns in the Medicaid program before I turn it over to Deb. In California, their enrollment forced $14.7 billion over budget. They were 222% over budget. In Kentucky, they were $3 billion over budget, which is funny because a lot of people say Kentucky is a Republican state that you can look to for success in the Medicaid program. $3 billion over budget doesn't sound like a success to me. 107% over budget. In North Dakota, there were $67 million over budget, which was 114% over their projections. And the last one I'll share with you is Oregon, which was $2 billion, 128% over what they had projected. This is what we think will happen to Maine if question two is passed. And I'd, uh, I'll turn it over to Deb now. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us to be here and thank you for coming out tonight. Just to build on that really quickly, those projected, um, the cost overruns over what was projected, I want to make that very clear. That was just in the first year and a half after the ACA expanded one and a half years and they were that much over budget so um, imagine what they are right now um, in 2002 Maine expanded Medicaid and as you heard a little bit um, already um, they were promised that the uninsured rate would go down on rate of uncompensated care would go down and those are some of the promises that we're hearing right now regarding this Medicaid expansion in 2002 those were not realized in 2002 the uninsured rate it was 12 percent before we expanded it was 12 percent after we expanded it's still hovering around 12 percent um, uncompensated care in the state of Maine in 2002 was it's 96 million dollars a year in 2011 after expansion uncompensated care was 196 million. None of those promises of what would happen if we expanded Medicaid ever reached fruition. The upward projection of uncompensated care continued to rise, as did the debt for hospitals. Um, as you heard, we, they expected 11,000 people to be enrolled. Um, it quickly skyrocketed and we had to cap it very soon, very soon, I believe within a year and a half, Heather, um, at 25,000 people. After that, the Medicaid budget in the state of Maine grew from $1.5 billion a year in 2002 to $2.5 billion a year in 2011. A billion dollars a year, a billion dollars a year in just nine years. That's huge. That's a tremendous, tremendously um, huge increase. And when you look at the state of Maine, what, would hap what happened with that? Well, what happened with that is we did not have the, um, the funding to support that kind of an increase. Medicaid budget eroded into all areas of state government. It ro eroded into our infrastructure. It eroded into our education budget. It also eroded into other programs within the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, there were several programs who were grossly underfunded um, to the point where um, in these last few years we've been rolling back some eligibilities in some programs in order to be able to fund other programs that are absolutely essential for people in the state of Maine. In the state of Maine we have what we call the section 21 and section 29. These are for people with severe and persistent cognitive and physical disabilities. For years we have had people languishing on wait lists waiting for services and we did not have the money to fund them. Over the last three or four years, we have been able to put some money towards those programs, and we have been able to take some people off those wait lists, but we still have people on them waiting for services. Now, I hear often the question, these people have main care, and they do, but I want to make very clear what I mean by these special services. Okay, they do have main care and they can receive their medical, but what they're not receiving under the waiver services, and it's capped by our ability to fund it, are the special community services and the home services that they need, the services that keep them in program programming, that keep them, excuse me, <clears throat> at a certain level of function. 
<clears throat> we also have underfunded our nursing homes and our assisted living centers. We've had several close across the state in the last few years. We finally have been able to start increasing funding for them, but they're still woefully underfunded. Our home health services, which is the front line for our senior, many of our seniors across the state, and we are an aging state, they are woefully underfunded as well. Those rely on what we can budget for reimbursement rates in order to reimburse for these services. If we expand Medicaid, if we expand Medicaid to somebody, to a, to a, a group or a population who is not part of the core mission of what Medicaid, as defined by the federal government, should serve our seniors, our disabled, and our children, if we expand to single, non-disabled adults, we will once again find ourselves in a position where we are going to have to reduce reimbursement rates for nursing homes, assisted living centers, for the, um, for the programming for our, our, our children, and for programming for those with disabilities in our state. Projected enrollment in Maine is approximately 70,000. Looking across the nation, they have grossly underestimated what was actually projected and what was actually and who actually enrolled. There's no reason that Maine will be any different. They're estimating 70,000. I think you'll find we'll be much closer to 110 to 130,000 people would enroll in Medicaid. All right. Um, along with those projected enrollments that were grossly underestimated, the costs of Medicaid expansion in the other states was also grossly underestimated. You heard some of the, um, the figures that were given to you before. There is absolutely no evidence that Maine will be any different looking across the nation at other states. And we know by our own experience that it will not be any different. We lived it in 2002. We suffered the consequences for it in all areas of state government and programs for the vulnerable, vulnerable and the most needy in our state until for the last uh, decade. And there's absolutely no reason to think that it would be any different now. Um, I just want to leave you with this, and I'll pass it on to Heather to co cover more parts, because I think the most interesting part of the conversation is going to come from your questions itself. But I want to leave you with this. You hear a lot about um, the federal government is going to pay 90% of this. Maine only has to pay 10. That's not true. Maine will only will get 90% from the federal government for a portion of the population who's going to be covered under Medicaid expansion. We are considered a pre-expansion state. We will not get 90% federal reimbursement for all of the people who are covered under Medicaid expansion. The rest of them will be at, a, at the 64-36 um, the split of which you heard about before. So that will drive up cost. And even if it were 10% that we had to pay, I want to tell you right now, 10% of a big number, a really big number, is still a really big number. And we cannot afford it in our state. So Heather? Thank you. Um, as Jim introduced me, I, I think he mentioned to you that I serve on the Appropriations Committee. That means I'm a bean counter. I really dig into the little numbers and the big numbers. That's my job. And as a state representative serving in the House of Representatives, our job as reps is to guard the purse strings. That is our function in the House of Representatives. So I'm looking out for the taxpayer as well as the people that are affected directly by this question. I have severe concerns about the process involved in this um, ballot initiative. For one thing, there was no public hearing and about 70 or 80,000 people are affected by this question. And we are making an assumption that they all want Medicaid expansion that they want this free gift. And I'm here to tell you there are strings attached to this free gift. And the question that you read on the ballot does not disclose the fine print. It is up to each and every one of us as voters to inform ourselves and make sure we understand what is going on with this question. Secretary of State Matt Dunlap admitted that he can only capture the essence 
of the bill. So when we had the question read to us, as it will appear on the ballot, it gives you a small snapshot of what you're being asked to vote on here. We don't even have firm numbers on how many people are affected. I met yesterday with the Portland Press Herald editorial board. There were four editors there. And I mentioned two pieces of the Medicaid program they did not even know about. I don't know that you could find four people in the state of Maine that know more about this question than those editors. They have been writing articles about this and they've already made the decision before we walked in and told us, informed us, they're already going to endorse this question and they hadn't even listened to other points of view on this. They had already made their minds up. So let me tell you a couple of the strings attached to this. First thing is called a state recovery. That means that when you turn 55, depending on the Medicaid services you're receiving, you may have to pay that back. I heard from an individual who was really surprised when his mother died and he thought he was going to inherit the home. The state of Maine and the federal government took that property. He didn't, he didn't receive any inheritance. There is a payback called a state recovery. And when you sign up for the Medicaid program, you may have a lien on your property. You may lose your family property. I grew up in poor rural Maine. And I can tell you a lot of people out there want to build equity for their families. So they will buy a piece of property and they will build a cellar, a basement, and they'll cap it off. We used to call them cellar hole people. I went to school with cellar hole people. My sister was a cellar hole people. <laughs> for about 10 years lived in her basement till they could save enough money to build a house on their basement. They want to build family equity. They want something for their children to inherit. It's really hard to pull yourself out of poverty. And when you put people in the Medicaid program, there is a big string attached. And I don't know that people that are receiving this program and signing up for this free product realize the string that's attached. And if this question passes, they will no longer have the opportunity to get subsidized health insurance without that string attached. They will be forced into the Medicaid program. They will not have the option that they currently have of accessing private health insurance with subsidies. They can pay full price, but they won't get the subsidies. We will be taking that, that option, that choice away from them. The other issue is we have a very long border that we share with New Hampshire. We have a lot of poor Mainers that live on that border. What if your doctor is in New Hampshire? With the Medicaid program, you must have services within the state of Maine. What if you get cancer or have a rare disease and you want to go to Boston for treatment? You can't automatically just cross the state borders and go to another state to receive services from, an, from a provider. So there are strings attached to this free program that may not be in the best interest of the recipient. We do talk a lot about the cost and the cost is tremendous to the taxpayer. There's also a cost to the recipient here that we need to factor in. I would like to, um, as a bean counter, just put a little frame of reference here because I think it's helpful when we're talking about money to put in a uh, frame of reference the difference between a million and a billion. And we talked about millions and billions here tonight. Um, one million seconds. If you're spend, to spend one dollar every second, it would take about 11 and a half days to spend one million dollars. It would take you how long at a dollar a second to spend one billion? 32 years. It's a huge difference between a million and a billion. The federal government is 20 trillion deficit. How long at a dollar a second does it take to spend one trillion dollars? Not 20 trillion, just the one trillion. That's 32,000 years. We have tremendous debt at the federal level, and we think that they're going to continue to be able to subsidize and pay at a 90-10 split. We're dreaming. 
if we think the state of Maine is going to continue forever with this expansion to receive 90% of the cost, the federal government has shown over and over again that they tend to ease back and change things as they run out of money. They're going to have to. This is unsustainable. So I, I think the money factor is important for us to understand. And when we expanded previously, we ended up with $750 million we didn't pay the hospitals. I work in a dental office. And I can tell you, if, my if our dentist had to wait years for payment, we'd be out of business. It's really hard to stay in business if people aren't paying their bills. And this could happen again. The state of Maine could be in a really rough spot. How do we pay all these bills? And if we have another market correction, we're really in trouble. The Medicaid program is designed for the blind, the pregnant, the disabled, the chronically ill. It is not designed for those able to work. We have other options for those able-bodied individuals. We're expanding and putting the able-bodied to the front of the line, and we are telling the people that are chronically ill and disabled that for whom the Medicaid program was designed and built and, and, and put in place to serve, we're telling those people on those wait lists, sorry, you go to the end of the line. You're not getting services. This wrong. This proposal is wrong. And there is a person to my left who has a child that receives services, and I'd like her to speak, Anna Lee. Well, thank you so much. Um, over my lifetime, I've dealt with insurance as a self-employed uh, person who bought insurance in the marketplace. Uh, do I need to? Sorry. Thank you. As a person who has purchased private health insurance, not as a part of a group, um, not as not having an employer provide it because I was my own employer, I also work with clients and I help them purchase insurance for their employees as a group. And I've worked my way through the Medicaid Medicare system for my daughter. My daughter, who's 34 years old, was born um, with a disability um, that started out. Um, a cerebral palsy, uh, which was diagnosed at about 11 months. And um, as she got older, um, we discovered other um, issues that, that come to light. Um, as they get older and learn to read, um, then you learn things about their vision. And she's uh, considered uh, uh, legally blind, um, even though she can see. She certainly can't drive a car and could not recognize me from here to the front row of that seat, except if I spoke. She's also learning disabled, um, so that impedes her ability to get higher education, uh, job training uh, that uh, she would need to be fully employed. So we've been through this system for quite a while. She was insured under my private insurance um, until she was uh, became um, I think it was around 18 or 20, because back then they weren't insured under your policy until um, you were 26. But eventually she wanted to be independent, and she moved away into a um, independent living um, establishment that had been developed for people with low vision and, and who were blind. But fortunately, they also had apartments available for people who were disabled. Um, because even though she can walk some few steps, she also is in a wheelchair. So we've been in Medicare uh, since she was 18. And after two years in Medicare, um, we, uh, the state enrolled us in Medicare. So she's insured by both Medicare and Medicaid. Something that I really notice that is troublesome um, is um, as her payee is the low, low reimbursement rate to doctors. I, I am stunned when I see the reports that come in about from the medical providers that for a service that other people may be billed through their insurance company for two or three hundred dollars, her doctor gets eleven dollars, eight dollars, two dollars and thirty cents. Um, now, just Medi Medicare picks up part of that as well, but because of that low and 
low reimbursement rate, her choice of doctors is not as free as those of us who have private health insurance are. There are many doctors, particularly specialists, who will not take Medicaid. Before she was 18, um, we were able to get second and third opinions about her diagnosis. Every time she was diagnosed with something and a doctor was uncomfortable about treating her, particularly her vision, because she also has um, epilepsy, and most doctors are concerned about surgery that requires them to go to sleep uh, when, when they have epilepsy, that we needed to go for second and third opinions. We were able to do that because I had private health insurance who would cover and who encouraged those second and third opinions. And those happened to have been in Boston, at Boston Children's Hospital, and um, in Albany, New York, where my husband is from and has families who are doctors, so we were connected with um, doctors who were familiar to us um, to get confirmed diagnosis. The early surgeries that she needed, even her local doctors suggested Boston Children's Hospital for orthopedic care. And we had orthopedic care at a Boston Children's Hospital till she reached 18. After she reached 18, even though she was eligible for a while to continue at Boston Children's Hospital, because by that time she was on Medicaid, um, we um, returned to, to Maine where she's continued to get certainly adequate, excellent medical care, but not always with the doctors to whom she is referred with a new um, issue, let's put it that way, pops up so that we can get that properly diagnosed and properly treated. So, I am concerned about adding so many new people who can get insurance by getting a job, because she says to me, I'm tired of living off the government, I want a job. But you can't get a job if you don't have, what she would like to do anyway is, is work in education without some college. And so to find a college program for somebody who has some learning difficulties um, is a challenge. She's worked at the Maine Medical Center, Poison Control Center now for about six or seven years. Worked there as a, um, somebody in a job training program and when that was over and there wasn't sufficient funds to hire her, I suggested that she stay on as a volunteer because if they ever got money, it would be good for her to be where the job was. So she stayed as a volunteer for a couple of years and they got the money and now she's been paid for about seven years. She only works three hours a week. It used to be six, but as the minimum wage in Portland went up, her hours went down. So there's a lot of good feel good legislation that happens that has adverse impact for a different set of the population. But, but we lived through that because it didn't, she doesn't need that income to live, but she would like to live on her income. And that is certainly our goal and, to, and certainly her goal but you know what her job is? She shreds papers. She said, that's really boring. It's in a room with no windows. I like to be with people. And she's a very social person. And pretty soon all those papers are going to be shredded. So they taught her to scan these papers, um, put them into files, and it took them a long time to treat her, teach her to do that because of the vision problem of lining it up, getting the files named properly because she didn't learn cursive when she was in high school. That was old fashioned. And so if the files are written in cursive, she needs assistance for that. So people that are able-bodied that can do all of those things should be working and should not be getting government insurance when there are so many people who are so much worse off than my daughter who need help and who don't want it. So I'm very, very concerned about what's going to happen. There are um, noticeable reductions now um, that she complains about. The, the group where she lives, um, almost, maybe none of them work. Sarah may be the only one that works. Uh, one, one other one may work. And they get very concerned. They all get together and they talk about the governor who keeps taking away their benefits and is she going to lose her Medicaid? And she's always asking me those questions. 
and they're really worried about that and they don't understand what they're hearing and it scares them so um, I really am concerned I'm certainly voting no and asking all my friends to do the same <clears throat> thank you very much before I open it up to questions one thing that you mentioned and I heard the panel talking earlier is we talk about what this is going to cost the state don't you have some numbers on what it would actually cost somebody living at this poverty level for a silver plan and insurance could you address that um, yeah I mean I have some <clears throat> right here on this document we have one of our colleagues is an insurance broker at this point and for somebody on a silver plan like a 30 year old from Cumberland County at 100% of federal poverty level would be able to buy an insurance plan with a $250 deductible a total $500 a year out of pocket for $24.44 a month um, 60 year old same thing um, at 100% of federal poverty level it would be the same $250 a $500 split and that would be $28 a month these are for a 60 year old and a 30 year old the 30 year old healthy person living in Portland Maine and right in Cumberland County at the upper end of 138 percent of federal poverty level um, it would be $250 a month $500 total I mean uh, excuse me a $250 deductible yearly deductible the total 500 out of pocket and the premium at um, $16,400 a year would be $49.44 a month very affordable that's for the 30 year old and for the 60 year old it would also be the same and it'd be $54 a month so and, and these are very affordable plans and if I, I might interject um, that's working part-time with a nine dollar minimum wage of about 26 hours a week yep so working a part-time job you would qualify for very affordable private health insurance without those strings that I mentioned attached I also believe correct me if I'm wrong that those private insurance plans that people are buying in the marketplace have much higher reimbursement rates to the doctors and to the hospitals You're correct. as well. You're correct, Rosalie. I was a medical biller for Maine Veterans Home for quite some time, and there's a hierarchy between payers. Your private pay, of course, is higher. Then you have your commercial insurances. Your commercial insurances have a higher level of reimbursement than Medicare, which is for disabled or seniors, and Medicaid. Medicaid is considered the payer of last resort. They are always the lowest. Why people aren't Aren't, aren't being asked to, if at all possible, have as many people sign up onto the exchanges. It's, it would be better for our, our, our health care system. They would get much higher levels of reimbursement. I don't, I don't understand the acceptance of, of wanting to um, offer health care at a lower price. I don't understand that, but you are correct. One other thing that I think we need to touch on is the fact that we have a tremendous provider shortage here in the state. We're very short on nurses, and we have a, a shortage of doctors. North of Bangor, it's my understanding that we do not have one child psychiatrist, not one. And we're having trouble recruiting now, and with lower reimbursement rates, the Medicaid payment pays so little that doctors have trouble making ends meet. They lose money. And we really need to have more people in the private insurance market with their higher reimbursement rates to help with their payer mix just so that they can stay in business. They can't continue to be operating at a loss and we're having trouble attracting providers to even come to the state of Maine. Thank you. I'll open it up for questions. Sir? <laughs> I'll work on that. It's very simple. A special interest group um, is able to pay for help and go out and get volunteers and collect enough signatures. And in the state of Maine, it's very easy to circumvent the legislature with the direct initiative process. It's um, in our constitution, has been so since the year um, 1913, I believe. 
and all that's required is that the sufficient number of signatures are certified by the Secretary of State and that question will be on the ballot. There is no way to change one word of that ballot question. Um, the, lang the legal language is as submitted. The legislature cannot touch it. The only thing we can do is um, refer the bill to uh, a committee go through the public hearing process and we might be able to put on the ballot a competing measure. But the actual question as submitted with the signatures gathered will be on the ballot. And um, the special interest groups have figured out how to hijack our system, run slick television ads in Portland and Bangor where the population centers are and there you go. Heather, and you of may the want 60 to repeat the question because I don't think they heard it on the air because they're trying to get a microphone. That's okay. So they people that are watching this. The, the question was, uh, how did this question get on the ballot? <laughs> that, was, that was the question. Yeah. Also, you know, why isn't the legislature doing something to change so that they can't do these kinds of things? and block you into spending money that you don't have. We, we have tried and it's difficult to get the votes when um, some people uh, of um, some people in the legislature think I guess this is a good idea. It, it's, um, it's a way to further an agenda without going through the legislative process. It's, it's almost easier to, d to uh, pass a law this way. Mm -hmm. And it's really dangerous to be um, governing through the ballot box. Uh, I feel, feel it's a very dangerous way to legislate. Who is responsible? Who's read the fine print? There is no scrutiny, no oversight. There's no way to ask whether the question's even constitutional or not, as we found with the ranked choice voting question. Blatantly unconstitutional, and yet it is the law of the land right now in the state of Maine. Mm -hmm. um, so these questions are very um, dangerous, and on um, election day, the voter becomes a lawmaker. You're doing my job. And I think that voters, rightly so, should boot me out of office if I was to not read the fine print. My job as a legislator is to know what's going on and understand the bill, and yet how many voters even know where to find the fine print of these ballot questions? You get a little question, that's just a little summary, a little snapshot of the bill. You really need to read the fine print. And I've had other legislators, I've had senators did not know where to find the fine print. It's on the Secretary of State's website. Mm. Maybe, maybe, maybe you should consider funding some of the state money to go against these types of things because you're doing it one-on-one, -on -one, a few, and that's kind of hard. That puts you in a bad position, but if you had the funds to fight this, it would help a whole lot. Well, we do, Thank we, you for coming, though. That, exactly. It does make it very difficult to fight because oftentimes the people who are who are gathering the signatures and, and um, putting these referendums forward, um, they already know that they have the resources coming behind them to push the initiative to the end. And often the if you're if you're on the opposite side of it, you're more reactionary and it's very hard. Um, but, but Heather is right. I mean, the devil lies in the details and that's what's mostly important. I bet probably not many of you, or if any of you, in this hall today knew about the estate recovery piece that's included in the Medicaid. I bet not many of you or any of you knew that if I were at 120% of federal poverty level and I had bought my insurance on the exchange, and I was happy with that insurance. I got to choose my doctor. I had real insurance. I was paying $30 a month. It's portable from state to state with me. It gets, I get coverage anywhere in the nation with that. Um, I bet you didn't know that if we expand Medicaid to 138% of federal poverty level, I have two choices. I now have to pay what somebody at 400% of federal poverty would have to pay, which is probably at, well, I have the price of that right here. For a 30-year-old, that would be, or oh, excuse me, here we go. For a 60-year-old person, I'm closer to 60, that would cost me $627 a month versus the $50 a month. That's a big difference, all right, if I'm in there. Or I could keep my private insurance if I wanted to pay that amount or I'm forced to go on Medicaid, main care, where it's not portable, where I probably can't keep my doctor, where I probably don't have access to the same specialists 
that I that I that I did because not because they're not here, but just just because they don't accept main care patients. Those are the realities of expanding main care in this state. Those are the realities of people who have bought into the exchanges and received terrific subsidies to help make that so affordable for them. Those are the realities of what they're facing. Six hundred and fifty dollars or go on welfare health insurance. And if I could touch upon that too, I believe it's uh, 61,123 signatures is what you need to get something onto uh, the ballot. I that, that seems like a lot, but you spend a couple afternoons in, in Cumberland or York County and, and your job is done. And this past session, uh, there was a bill, LD31, which passed uh, overwhelmingly in the House. It didn't make it out of the Senate, but it would have required that uh, you get uh, as many signatures as 10% of the votes cast for uh, governor in the last election in each congressional district, and the, it never made it out of the Senate, unfortunately. Yeah. <clears throat> you need to follow the money. Well, I, I just say that because the state of Maine is a, is a experiment for the lobby outside of our state that comes in. They can spend a million dollars and push through legislation. That's true. In the state of Maine grassroots can't raise a million to fight it we sometimes win but not very often but they can't spend a million dollars in california and get the same result so we are the cheap date for these referendums the other thing just on the recovery piece because i have real life experience with this people don't understand that medicaid for the seniors when they go into the nursing home <clears throat> they're paying seven eight nine thousand dollars a month if, if your loved one is there for two years, there's a $200,000, $250,000 bill that somebody is, and it's not for rich people. It's the fact that my best friend up in Etna, Maine, is paying $50 a month for his mother who passed away because she didn't know and wrote a check two years before she went into the nursing home and they are recovering that money from the heir. Or they were going to you know, take him to court and go after his home. So this is a real problem that people don't see and understand. If, if I might, the 60, uh, just jumping just a second, um, the signature gathering, um, I think we've all been at the polls and seen people with the clipboards trying to get our signatures. <clears throat> and be really careful about that. I have heard people say, don't worry. This doesn't commit you. It's just giving the opportunity for the question to be on the ballot. You can always vote no in November. Once they have the, the required number of signatures, which is about 10% of the previous people that voted in the, 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 the most recent gubernatorial election, so roughly 65,000 signatures, it's roughly 650,000 voters. Um, once they have the 65,000 signatures, boom, it's on the ballot. And oh, by the way, they pay a lot more than minimum wage for those signature gatherers. Mm. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, oh. oh. yep. <laughs> Hi, my name is Natalie, and I live right here in Bedford. Um, and my question is I heard you say that it's only $50 a month for somebody, I think who makes $9 an hour working 26 hours a week. I could be wrong on the numbers, but I think you said something along that. And while $50 a month sounds pretty reasonable, I know my family makes 50, more than $50,000 a year, and just my husband works, and we don't have car payments. We have very limited student loan debt. We rent, we don't own. And $50 a month extra for us when we live paycheck to paycheck, because only my husband works, would literally bankrupt us right now. So for somebody making $12,000 a year, $50 a month is a lot. So my question would be, what do you, does anybody up here have a solution for the people like that who $50 a month actually isn't affordable? Because if you're only making $12,000 a year, I mean, no matter how you slice it, you have to pay rent, you have to buy yeah. food, you have to buy tra have transportation. $50 a month isn't affordable, and 
healthcare is important. <laughs> All right, yes. I mean, you do have a couple of options, and these were the navigators or someone who's in, who is who is very knowledgeable in the insurance market can help you. These numbers were given to me by Representative Karen Vachon, and I bet if Adelaide, is that your name? Yeah. Natalie, okay, thank you. It's hard to hear up here. And, and, you know, and I bet if you had some further questions, uh, she would be a great resource for you to reach out to, but at the at the nine at the 26 hours a week at minimum wage okay that would put you at the 100 percent of federal poverty level that's 24 dollars a week or excuse me 24 dollars a month okay the 16 the upper end the 138 that's where the 50 dollar piece comes in all right but you I, I understand that but there are other options as well okay you can opt to have right here of course your deductible goes up your total out-of-pocket goes up, okay? But if you're healthy and 30 years old, your deductible would be the 6,000, total out-of-pocket 7,150, still yes expensive if you are lower income, but you would be covered for any catastrophic care and you could provide either a, ch you could qualify for either a charity care through the hospital. Hospitals are required to cover up to 150 percent of federal poverty level because they are nonprofits. That's from the federal government, okay? They could be the secondary payer and cover that for you. And it's a zero premium a month, zero. So there are plenty of options. These numbers right here that we that we give you, these are what, we're, what Karen ran for us the other day to let people know that there are options for folks out there and it doesn't have to be Medicaid where if you're on Medicaid, your options are limited. Another thing that we have to be really careful of, this is for non-disabled adults, okay? The vast majority of them are healthy, able to work, non-disabled adults. If we are taking them out of the private insurance market and putting them into a, a welfare Medicaid program, all right, then what we're doing is we're destabilizing the insurance market too. So there's, there's all kinds of things that we have to look at here and weigh the odds. And ultimately, no matter how you weigh it, it's not good for got not good news for Maine if we expand Medicaid and we're taking choices away from people who may have private health insurance and not only that we're denying the ability to really get to what the core mission of Maine Medicaid is and that is to serve the disabled the severely needy the blind pregnant moms <coughs> children We've had nursing homes close because we can't keep in, keep in, in um, up with the rates of reimbursement. There's a family who was from Bangor, Maine, um, or the Bangor area. Um, I know that she does not mind me using her name. Um, Cindy and her family, they had a family home here in this state. They sold that family home when their son Michael was getting ready to graduate from high school because they knew there was not services for him. He's a disabled, he's a more higher functioning dis, um, autistic child, but certainly not high enough functioning where he had could be independent. He still needed some services. She knew there was nothing for him. He was gonna go on to an adult wait list. They sold their family home in anticipation of Cindy having to quit her job and her husband be the only breadwinner and moved into a double wide mobile home. That's what they did. Still, there were no services. Finally, Michael was able to get into some services, but they were so inadequate for his level of function. On a day that we were ex debating Medicaid expansion in the state of Maine, on the house of the floor, on, on the floor of the house, that family, a Maine family, they were in a moving van heading down I-95 on their way to Virginia because we couldn't adequately support that family. And I think that is such a crying shame. And we can't do it if we're going to expand Medicaid because that will take 54 million at minimum, $54 million a year to cover the cost share between that and the federal government. We're underfunding these wait lists and other services by $40 million a year already. Where are we going to get the money? That's So my question, I guess, would be, why is, and you, I know you can't answer this with facts, so I apologize. Well, I may be able to. Well, okay. Um, 
Why is it, it's a you think question, that's why you can't. Why, why do you think then that so many people have not signed up through the marketplace, people who I, I know who it's not in their monthly budget, why do you think so many people are going without health care and not signing up if it's, if it's so affordable and such a good option to go through the marketplace? There's a lot of people who have not signed up through the market, number one, because they don't know what's available and they feel as though that the cost is going to be so high. I work with several of these folks and it's not until after I actually started working there and running the business and told them, you know what, you need to go talk to somebody and they actually have gotten insurance and it is affordable for them. All right, but a lot of them really don't think it's going to be affordable, and what they do is they opt to take the penalty instead, thinking it's cheaper. Well, fifty dollars a month for a sixty-year-old is a heck of a lot cheaper than the yearly penalty is going to be, and you have to weigh those, weigh it like that. All right, for a thirty-year-old, it's it's a lot cheaper than the penalty at the end of the year. You have to weigh those options. Um, some folks, of course, are above that 138% of federal poverty level, and they wouldn't qualify for Medicaid anyways. Those, you still get substantial um, um, cost-saving cost reductions and um, tax credits up to 250% uh, of federal poverty level. So I would tell anybody who is within that range, go talk to somebody. There are options out there for you. They really are. And are those services free for people like to get? You can you can go to you can go to <laughs> for any people who are low income and who don't know the, don't know how to navigate the marketplace and don't know about these. Are there free services available for them to get this information so that they can find an affordable health care option? I, and if there's not, would any of the representatives at the table be willing to sponsor a bill that would offer something like that in the state? You have for Consumers for Affordable Health Care right in Augusta, Maine, uh, C-A-K-E, C-A-C-H? C-A-H-C. H-C, there we go. Um, they're right in Augusta, Maine. Consumers for Affordable, affordable Health Care, they can actually help you navigate. They'll try to steer you to Medicaid, but really, your best option is the private insurance market. It really is. You get so much more coverage, it's portable and everything else, but they can put you in touch with folks who can help. Also, I believe, <clears throat> and please don't quote me on this, I'd be happy to find out for sure and let you know. I can share my, my information with you. But um, I believe my colleague Karen, I don't believe she gets paid anything. Unless, unless she actually do, sells. Well, you you do not pay brokers. Yeah. Unless, un you yeah. can go to every broker in Bedford and ask them to quote. Yeah. And you won't get that many different quotes because there's not very many insurance companies in Maine. There's yeah. only a few choices. A broker has to show you at least three quotes, do three comparisons on rates, coverage, out-of-pocket, uh, what tier drugs they're going to mm -hmm. pay for. It doesn't cost a dime to yes. get that information. The broker gets paid from the carrier that, they, that you eventually decide to go with. Yep. If you go with no carrier, there's no money involved. Yep. Well, so what is free to find that information out? Um, the, so the, I think it is important to, to um, keep in mind that for the able body, there are options. And as was mentioned, the charity care program, I think it's important to understand that most doctors in the state of Maine are working for hospitals. And as such, they must provide the chari charity care program, which is on a sliding scale. And that that is real doctors in a real hus in a real office setting. It's not the emergency department. It's a real doctor in a real office. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is we have about 140 locations peppered throughout the state of federally qualified health centers and rural health centers. They again are a creation of the federal government to serve um, those low income, underinsured, uninsured individuals. So those are real doctors in a real office setting all over the state to help provide health care for um, low income individuals. The Medicaid program, again, was not designed for able bodied individuals. It was supposed to be designed, is, it is specifically designed for the disabled and the blind and the pregnant, this is, and pregnant women. It's not designed to serve the able bodied. And this is, this is going to put pressure on and hurt the private insurance market. So if you want to crash the private insurance market, vote for Medicaid expansion. Um, we already are down to two carriers in the state of Maine. Anthem is pulled out, and we only have a commitment from Harvard Pilgrim for, for next year. 
So this is a, a, a big concern for those that like to have private health insurance available. Additionally, in terms of free services, uh, and I wish more people knew this, you can go to the Bureau of Insurance website in the state of Maine and find every plan that would be available to you, and you can quite literally Google Obamacare subsidy calculator and find out exactly based on your income, your age, whether or not you're a smoker, your income level, and find out what plans are available to you and what the federal subsidy would be. I wish more people knew that because uh, a, lo a lot more people would probably be signed up in the, in the private marketplace. Yeah. Hi there. Um, you speak of 100%, 138% of poverty level. Can you give me the equivalent in terms of income? Numbers, please. Yes. I don't know what those numbers 100 are. 100% of federal poverty level for a single person is $12,600 a year. 138% um, of federal poverty level is... 16-something. Uh, 16-7, 16-5, 16, 16, 16, 16, around 16,500. I think the somewhere. actual phrasing of the ballot question might include the yes, dollar. Yes, it does. Dollar. Okay. does. <clears throat> I'll read that again. Oh, he has it. Okay. Do you want Maine to expand Medicaid to provide health care coverage for qualified adults under age 65 with incomes at or below 138% of the federal poverty level, which in 2017 means $16,643 for a single person and 22412 for a family of two? And I would tell you that number is 28,000 for a family of four. Yep. <clears throat> I'd love to hear some more questions. Your questions are the interesting ones. That's where we were able to Any answer where you're, confu where you're confused or, or need more information. We can talk all day, but <laughs> it may not be sharing anything that you don't know. So. I have one. There's one. Go ahead. Oh, there's a oh, question here's one. Take over them. here. Here we go. Run, Heidi, run. <laughs> Heidi Sampson, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> no, up no, here. The gentleman. Fourth row, fifth row up. Oh. Sorry. Uh, Representative, Representative Sanderson, uh, in the TV ads, you see this. It's going to bring jobs to Maine. Huh. How do they think it's going to bring jobs? I don't understand. I, if you could share us any, any, where these jobs are at. Yeah, they, they say this is going to bring, well, we heard 3,000 uh, yesterday at the editorial board. Representative Siraki, Heather here, heard it was going to bring 6,000 jobs. I don't know what jobs. I've asked that question, what jobs is it going to bring? I mean, we have a nursing shortage right now. We can't fill all the nurses. We have a doctor shortage in our state. We can't fill out the, all the doctors. I don't know what jobs they say this is going to bring because this money is not just... Well, they say it's going to bring $520 million a year into the state of Maine. Well, it may be, but this is not just a, a big chunk of money that we get to spend wherever we want. This is money that is going to come to the state of Maine because somebody has gone to the doctor <clears throat> and that's going to pay the doctor at a reduced rate. This is not just a, it's not a boon for us. It's, it's, it's already encumbered to pay a bill. So. We, we already have a shortage of these folks and, and, and what, 30,000 jobs that we can't fill in the state of Maine in, in many different industries. So I'm, I'm not sure. I, Heather has asked. I have asked. And we have, not, we have yet to receive a single cohesive answer about exactly what jobs they mean. I don't know because they can't fill the ones that they have. To put it in perspective, too, um, a direct service provider, which is one of the, the lower end jobs in healthcare, they are so hung up for people currently that there are places in Maine that are offering $800,000 sign on bonuses to find people in these low level healthcare jobs. To think that this new revenue, which as uh, Rep. Sanderson said, we have to dedicate that to the Medicaid program. We can't just invest it into whatever we want. And so there, there's, there's really no way that I can see it how this would create these high-end jobs, new doctors, new surgeons, new psychiatrists. They, they, they say that these high-end jobs are going to come into Maine, but number one, we already have a shortage of them, and, and, and this money isn't going to create a, any environment where they would have an opening to fill. 
we, we already cannot fill low-end healthcare jobs. How on earth would we get new doctors or, or attract talented people to this state? And, I, and I, I'd like to build on that for a little bit. I mean, he's talking about the folks who are your CNAs, your home health, home health aides, um, the folks who work with the home health agencies to go in. They're the front line with our seniors, oftentimes in many of our rural um, areas. Um, they may be the first person that your grandmother or your grandfather sees in the morning. They go in, they help get them out of bed, they help get them breakfast, and if these people don't show up, well, they don't get breakfast. They don't get out of bed, all right? We're having trouble funding those services. Not a penny, not a penny of Medicaid expansion will go to help fund those services. Not one penny. Not one penny of Medicaid expansion will go to seniors. Not one penny will go to the disabled. Not one penny will go to children. And not one penny will go to any of these ancillary services that help serve the most vulnerable of our state. Every penny will go to pay a bill for someone who is a non-disabled adult. Non-disabled. That's, that's where the money's gonna go. It's already encumbered to pay a bill. Maybe more information than you needed, but. <laughs> Thank you very much, all, all of you, for coming out tonight and answering a lot of questions. But Jim alluded to my thought when you said follow the money. What's behind this? Who's going to benefit from expanding Medicaid? Who's going to be making money from this? And why is this on our ballot and coming before us as the citizens of the state of Maine? I want to know who's going to benefit from it, whether it's they're getting free health care, or is this some kind of a, a program to undermine the insurance companies in the state of Maine? If I could, if I could say, I, I am frankly a little bit puzzled by some of the supporters of this question. For instance, the Maine Hospital Association and the primary care physicians, because when I work in a dental office, we prefer private insurance. And um, the person I work for has never accepted Medicare or Medicaid. The reimbursement rates are just too low. And so I have to, I have to question why you would want to funnel people towards the Medicaid welfare program with their low reimbursement rates instead of encouraging them to access private insurance with the higher reimbursement rates as a provider it doesn't make sense to get less money. Again, I'm a bean counter, so I look at the fiscal note. And to say that the, the state of Maine is going to bring in in federal dollars and in this pursuit for this money grab of $500 million, I think it's actually a loss. I don't know how that, that you know, if you're taking um, and paying for services and getting reimbursed by private insurance, it would be a larger m figure than the 500 million. So actually taking a financial hit to um, accept Medicaid over private insurance. So I am really puzzled by that. I don't understand how, they, they, how they're doing their math because the charity care that is going out is basically been flat. And, and we look to other states for data. Why? We have proof right here in the state of Maine with previous expansions of what happened here in Maine with our population and our people. We know we developed these wait lists with these, these um, severely disabled people on these wait lists because we could not come up with enough money to take care of them. And we know that we owed the hospital $750 million in unpaid old overdue welfare Medicaid bills. We couldn't pay our bills. So why would we want to go down that trail again when we already have all the evidence we need here that in Maine it doesn't work? And if I can add on here, I mean, Heather's the bean counter. She sits on the Appropriations Committee. She used to be on the Health and Human Services Committee with me. I've been, I would have been um, sentenced to four terms on the <laughs> Health and Human Services Committee. And, you know, I do love it there because everything we do impacts lives, impacts people. Um, and I jokingly say sentence there because sometimes it's probably the, the last place on earth I would ever be up to and including in jail. Um, because it's heartbreaking. In that committee, we are literally forced to set priorities 
to take a look at programmings, um, programs that may be sound like a fabulous idea. We have to take a look at, okay, but do we have the money? Are we able to afford this? What is the end result? What is the efficacy and what's the, what's the pay down the road? Is it going to be better health for folks? Is it maintaining health for folks? And unfortunately, in the, in the seven years that I have been on that committee, oftentimes the first question that we have on there has nothing to do with the outcomes or, okay, who do we have to serve? Who's the most vulnerable? Who do we have to set a priority for, such as our most vulnerable, our seniors, our disabled, our children, all right? To me, their priorities, a triage, if you will, um, that we have to set. But oftentimes, the first, qu the first question is, is something that should be over in Heather's committee room. And that is, how much federal money are we going to get? Or how much federal money are we going to lose? Ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter what the federal money is. If we don't have our portion of state taxpayer funded money, you're never going to get the federal money. And I guarantee you, after this last budget that we went through for two years, we're not going to have the extra $54 million, and I think that's a low cost for the first time for the first year of Medicaid expansion. We're already looking at probably a $30 to $50 million supplemental budget when we go back in in January, because some of these programs I've told you about for the needies, the home health, the services, the 21, Section 21, Section 29 for disabled, these community-based services, we may have put money in for this year that we're in currently, this fiscal year, but guess what? They put this much money in, zero dollars for the second year in a biennial budget. We have to fund them for a year. We didn't do it, did we, Heather? We did not. We did not, because they wanted to balance the budget. And if you're passing a budget without adequately funding services that are vital for everybody, you're only passing the illusion of a budget. So when we go in in January, there's going to be anywhere from 30 to $50 million ask just from the Department of Health and Human Services to get through the second year of the biennial budget. Now let's load on a projected $55 million for Medicaid expansion on top of that. Now we're up to $100 million. Who's going to pay for it? Where is it going to come from? I'll tell you where it's going to come from. Those people that we need funding for the second year, they're not going to get it. Re nursing homes who we've been able to increase reimbursement for, they're probably going to be reduced again because they're the low-hanging fruit. That's the easy stuff because we control the rates that they get paid. All right? Education, yep, yeah, we'll take some for that. Revenue sharing, well, you're at 2% for revenue sharing. Should be 5%, but guess what? You're probably going to go down to 1%. And that, these are just projections that I'm throwing out there. And, base, and ladies and gentlemen, I bet they're going to be very real at realities if we expand Medicaid. This is just not about providing 70,000 people with taxpayer-funded Medicaid, all right? Of that 70,000, and I think that number is grossly underestimated, of that 70,000 people, if we're working on that number, only 24,000 of them, and that's on average, approximately, do not qualify for the subsidies that I told you about. Those folks are below 100% of federal poverty level. Why? Maybe they don't realize that if they worked a couple extra hours a week, they might be able to qualify. Probably more likely, though, probably more likely, and I say that because one of my friends who's an insurance broker asked a young lady who didn't qualify at the 100%, she was too low, She's, she asked her one day, have you asked your boss if maybe you could pick up a couple extra hours a week? And she said, well, no. She called Karen back. She was able to. She was so thrilled to be able to afford her own insurance. She was so proud of herself. That may be happening. Probably what's happening for folks under the 100% of federal poverty level is there is an underlying medical condition that's preventing them from working. For those people, we need to, yes, keep looking for a solution for those folks. 
Remember, we still have the hospitals, we still have FQHCs, we still have other stuff going on. All right, we have charity care. But are we going to put the entire main care budget, the entire state budget, at risk when we just need to keep looking for a solution for less than 24,000 people in a population of 1.2 million people? That's the question. And the answer is no. We really can't. We really can't. As Deb was mentioning, trying to figure out as a bean counter how to pay for this, I just want to throw this out at you. The median family income, family income in the state of Maine is $50,000. We're not rich here in the state of Maine. We're one of the death spiral states. We have more people dying than being born. We have a very low birth rate. Maine is, is doing better. Our economic numbers are improving, but we have a ways to go to be a healthy, vibrant economy. The average median family income of $50,000 pays about $1,000 a year in state income tax. That average family footing the bill for this cost, I want to throw this out at you. In order to implement Medicaid expansion, the Department of Health and Human Services has to hire 103 new state workers to administer the program. They will have a caseload of 700 people per case worker at a cost of about two and a half million dollars for us to hire these state workers, which also means we then have an unfunded actuarial liability because we have to also pay for pension and all the retirement costs down the road. But let's look at just the two and a half million dollars. That's a puny little dollar amount, right? Two and a half million, that's nothing. Well, let's look at one million. Remember I said, it, it, you know, trying to put money in perspective, the difference between a million and a billion? How long does it take for that median family earning $50,000, paying $1,000 a year in state income tax, how long does it take that family to provide $1 million for the state of Maine to spend a thousand years. Where is this money going to come from? We have to really think hard about our priorities here. Our, our disabled need to come first. The able-bodied, the able to work need to work and provide for themselves. They can provide for themselves. The disabled cannot provide for themselves. Anna Lee's daughter cannot provide for herself. That's where our money should be going. Well, I'll be a little more blunt with my question then. My question is, you don't just put something on a referendum unless somebody's gonna benefit from this. You've gotta follow the money every time there's a question. Who will benefit from this being passed? And who funded the signature gathering? Who's behind this? That's what the people of the state of Maine need to know, in my opinion. You know, I don't know who's gonna benefit. The state of Maine is not gonna benefit. The taxpayers of the state of Maine are not gonna benefit. And the most vulnerable in this state are not going to benefit. Not even the people who qualify for Medicaid expansion are going to benefit. They're not going to be in a commercial plan that is portable. They're not going to be in a commercial plan where they have choices of their doctors and specialists. They're going to be stuck on a welfare plan where you have to have your services here in the state of Maine. And many of the doctors in our state do not accept Maine care. So I don't know who is going to benefit in the state. Outside the state, to be honest with you, Barbara, I don't know whose push this is. I don't know. I, I can guess and make assumptions of what the ultimate agenda is. But sitting in a forum like this, I would rather speak in fact versus assumptions and um, speculations. So um, without 100% fact, um, I'll, I'll end there. But overall, Maine is not going to benefit. You know, I think there's consequences of all these decisions that we make. And the consequences that I have seen, <clears throat> as excited as people were about the Affordable Care Act, to have insurance for the first mm -hmm. time, how many people 
had their hours cut at work below 30 hours so they wouldn't get health insurance. I know some that did. So their income went down and they still didn't get their insurance. So there's consequences to all of these decisions. In Portland, the minimum wage goes up, but hours get cut. Yep. There's consequences for our decisions. And there will be really serious consequences if this is voted in that are far greater than the two I just spoke about. Someone else had a question, though. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Heather. Um, I live in Biddeford. Um, so I have two questions. Um, one, um, so I got the flyer when I came in. Um, this one, the no welfare expansion mm -hmm. one. Um, I found online this one that uh, abortion is on the 2017 yes. main ballot. Is this your guys also? That's not mine, but it's some. No, no, no. no. That's that's a different. That's not the main heritage policy. This is this is okay. the main heritage yeah. one page. But go ahead and ask your question. Gotcha. Um, no, this one it just said that um, this will cause many additional abortions, and I just wanted to know if um, you had the numbers from the other states that um, showed the actual addition of purely elective abortions. But I you guys don't. didn't put out that paper. I did not know. No. no. Uh, one thing I do know right now, um, we cannot use state funding, state taxpayers' dollars to fund abortions. Right now, the ACLU, and I believe Plain, Planned Parenthood, is suing the state of Maine, um, looking to have that covered by Medicaid. If they win, and I believe they have sued and perhaps won in some other states, that will allow um, Medicaid taxpayer funded coverage for your health care um, to pay for abortions. Um, the last thing I am going to do is debate um, the right or wrong of abortions. I don't believe that that is I don't want to my that business. <laughs> that's, right? I'm not I'm not here to no. challenge you guys. No, no, I'm, no. I'm on the side of solution. Yeah. That's I don't yeah. I don't want to for fight sure. anybody nothing. For sure. I, I just wanted to know like if you had an I think just number. speaking for the group we have nothing to do with that. So it's yeah. that's <clears throat> No, but I want to I, I want to finish this though. I I do want to finish this because but I do <clears throat> know that um, the Hyde amendment prohibits the use of taxpayer funds mm -hmm. to fund abortions. Um, I know Planned Parenthood gets met, gets a lot of money to help women who should decide to go down this route. I do not believe taxpayer funds should, should be used for it. And if this is a real challenge, um, a real um, this is a real thing that they're suing the state of Maine and if it does pass and if Medicaid does pass and you extend Maine care to all this new population then it stands to reason that probably the number of abortions may go up that we can follow through claims data and that's how you would get that number right that's that's what I wanted to know if it like, yeah. I'm not going to challenge you on it. If you guys yeah. had put that out, then no. I would have wanted an actual number. I mean, no. um, I'm from Connecticut originally, mm -hmm. and I needed Planned Parenthood and didn't qualify for any of the funding, so I had to pay out of pocket mm -hmm. for my life-saving surgery and didn't have the money to pay for the anesthesia, so I had to have surgery awake, um, which That happened at terrible. a Planned Parenthood office? Yeah. Um, I had painkillers. That should never have... It, no that, one should have um, that. First kind of, of all, that should awake. never have happened in a Planned Parenthood office. They should have immediately transferred you to a hospital. Um, yeah. It's standard um, in some places. But um, I have a second question. Sure. Um, here. Okay. Yeah, it's it's paid for by the same people that were on the bottom of this one, which is why that I figured it might have been yours. That was it. Yeah, different um, path. My other question, like. I really am just on the side of a solution. Mm -hmm. So we moved here because my husband is in medical school and we love it here and we would love to stay here and we're trying really hard to fight to stay in Maine. Um, people are asking who this benefits. Um, me, um, in two months I'm gonna be 30. I work, um, I'm a paramedic and I we had signed up for COBRA when I went part-time and when my husband quit to go to medical school everything was set in place and then it ended up being double what we quoted and we lost our health insurance for us and our twin infants 
um, who were board preemie, who have mm -hmm. medical issues. And so I sat in the Department of Health and Human Services office every day for five hours with my infants waiting for the best option for me and we qualified and you know like Heather was saying there is a recovery thing my aunt lost her house from that I'm aware of that mm -hmm. um, I still go to Connecticut to work because I would take a huge pay cut to work here I would love to work here mm -hmm. but I can't afford it and when I'm in Connecticut with my daughter she got pneumonia and I couldn't get my child treated there because my insurance didn't carry over so I would love not to be on Medicaid, but I'm lucky enough to be poor enough to be able to be on it, and I'm so, so grateful for it. Like, I don't, I wouldn't, my kid wouldn't be alive without it, and I don't know where we would be without it. But I would love an ideal solution. Like, we would love to stay here when my husband's a doctor, but we can't. I wanna know what you would tell me is my solution. Like, without my in-laws, we literally couldn't pay rent, let alone Fifty dollars a month for insurance. Like we're without them, we're still two hundred dollars less than our mm -hmm. monthly rent. So what? Well, what my, ideally would you like? My, my, like my me mind to is do? reeling with questions of of a lot of personal questions that you probably don't want to put out over the airwaves because this is going out live in the community. All right, so maybe we could talk afterwards. But I just, I want to know, know what income, you would suggest I mean, for your, somebody like me. I mean, is your total? What's your total family income? Um, six thousand a year. That's your total family income. Mm -hmm. Okay. She goes to Connecticut and works. But you go to Connecticut and work. Because if I work here full time and take the pay cut and take the insurance deduction and the child care deduction, my take home is five hundred and sixty dollars a month, which still doesn't meet rent. And in Connecticut, my child care is free. Is that gross or take home? Gross. Six thousand dollars a year. Oh, that's take home. The gross would be here if I worked. Um, that would be five hundred sixty dollars take home a month gross if I worked here. If she worked here, I, I think she needs to talk to Kim. Yeah, I think you need to talk to Kim. Yeah. Too much information. We can talk after. Perfect. I can give you a name. Thank you so much. Yep. Any other questions? I have one. <clears throat> when I was delivering, um, I'm the one that went around putting the flyers out, and um, something came up to me. Somebody said, does this fund non-citizens? Is there something to the effect that this funds non-citizens? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Up to age 21, non-citizens. Just automatic qualification. Yep. Does it fund children of Maine under the age of 21 automatically? No. Wow. Any other no, questions? It's not. Without income? There's no income qualification for non-citizens. But one more, I think. I think it's the 100 to, up to 138. Uh, one question that I have, I don't understand how through a ballot initiative, tax dollars could be expended without the legislature's action. And what course would a citizen have to get standing to pursue some type of uh, remedy for this? Well, you could approach your legislator and you could ask them to put in a bill to prohibit spending dollars, uh, spending bills via the referendum because any kind of a taxation bill must originate in the House. Um, as Heather told you earlier, the House controls the purse springs. Uh, purse strings. Um, a bill, I believe, can start either in the Senate or the House. It, it, it will have a fiscal note. Um, so. That itself is, isn't unconstitutional, but anything that has any kind of a taxation element to it must start in the House. So I'm not sure how we could do this unless you wanted to, you know, say a ballot initiative can be policy only with no fiscal note attached. If it's going to be um, a, via a citizen's referendum, because on the citizen's referendum, as Heather said, this doesn't have the benefit of a public hearing. This particular bill you are hearing has not had the benefit of a public hearing. The public has not had the benefit to sit in a room 
hear both sides of the story, have a legal analyst go through with a fine tooth comb with you explaining all the ins and outs and all the details and all the complications. Um, the, the devil is in the details. That's where the devil lives, is right in there. And as you could see with some of the recoveries and, and everything, estate recovery and other pieces that most people don't know about when it comes to this, um, you're voting on something you don't know about. But, you know, this is where I think the referendum is, while I appreciate the intent behind the citizens' referendum, I think the referendum process has become a tool for special interests to circumnavigate the legislature when, when the bills that they have before the legislature don't go their way. And you know, the legislature has rejected um, Medicaid expansion five times. Some will say the legislature has passed it. But no, the legislature has rejected it five times. Um, and now their special interest groups are taking it out and getting 60,000 signatures and 1.2 million people um, will be on the hook for Medicaid expansion if it passes and all its costly endeavors. I probably didn't answer your question, but yeah. <clears throat> To, to be honest with you, I mean, I used to be a huge advocate, but now that I'm seeing the dark side of the referendum process, um, while I would fight vigorously to keep the citizen's veto in our um, constitution and in our process, so the citizens have a right to, to veto anything that the legislature passed, um, I think I am now becoming a stronger proponent of a constitutional amendment which would take out the clause from our Constitution saying that the citizens of this state have the right to enact legislation independent of the legislature. That's why you vote for us. Um, that is our job. Um, we are a representative government. We are not a democracy government. And voting by referendum is putting us into a democratic mob rule type situation. And when you look across the globe, we see that oftentimes through history, those kind of governments have failed every time. Any other questions? <clears throat> Just to clarify her statement, <clears throat> we are a constitutional republic, we are not a democracy. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming, and I really thank these people. They drove, they came, they gave up their night to be with us. Thank you very much.